Welcome to The Pit Stop, your monthly tune-up with refining experts. Again, I'm Doug Aswell, and this is my co-host, Jeannie Brazeroo. Hi, everyone. It keeps me pointed down the track. How are you doing today, Jeannie? I'm doing good, Doug. How are you? Doing pretty well. I can't awesome. complain too much. Well, so, Doug, <clears throat> I've been thinking about uh, regeneration lately and, and how hmm. cool it is. Do you ever think about that? Like, you know, there are worms that regenerate. There are gecko tails. Do you know when geckos lose their tails? Oh, that yeah. They regenerate. How cool is that? Yeah, I grew up in South Mississippi, so we had lizards all over the place that would uh, do that. They would, you would reach for them, grab their tail, and poof, it'd come off, and then you'd see the same one with a little tiny tail growing again a little bit later. It's kind of like me with coffee in the morning, you know, I have to have it to regenerate also. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, so today we're going to be talking about a different kind of regeneration. So sulfuric acid regeneration or spent acid regeneration related to sulfuric acid alkylation units in the refining space. Um, you know, it's important that we find something to do with that sulfuric acid as it leaves the alkylation process. And so in this discussion, we'll do just that. Um, today, we're inviting Kirk Bailey um, uh, to join us in this conversation. Yeah, and Kirk's been with MECS for nearly 10 years. His, one of his focuses is actually in the uh, SAR plants that are here in North America, and he's done a really good job. Some of you have actually more than likely met Kirk in his travels and visits. And in, in the case of SAR, it's best if you can find something to do with that acid you're using for your alkylation process, that big, important, money-making part of the process. But anytime you can find something to take a byproduct and use it for something else, it's always the best thing for a process. Yeah, and that's yeah. definitely what we're going to be dealing with today. Yep. So today we're going to show you a pre-recorded discussion with our guest. And afterwards, we'll take your questions. Um, please submit those in the Q&A feature within Zoom. Um, so please stick around after the video. Yeah, and if for some reason you get disconnected, don't worry about it. Just click on the link that was in the email you received after you registered for the event, and it should bring you right back. If you do happen to miss some time, we'll have it uh, recorded and out on refiningpitstop.com, and uh, you'll be able to see the entire recording there later if you missed anything. So with that said, let's get going. On to our next pit stop. Welcome to the Pit Stop, your monthly tune-up with Refining Experts. We're here today with Kirk Bailey. He's uh, joining us. I'm Doug Aswell. This is Jeannie Brandsrew, my co-host. Today we're talking about spin acid recovery units. Uh, some of you may have uh, those units on site. Before we get started on all that, though, Kirk, uh, give us an idea of who you are, maybe some information about you, where you went to school, how long you've been with DuPont, some of the things that uh, you've done over the years as well. All right. Well, thanks, Doug. Thanks, Jeannie. I appreciate the time and opportunity today. Uh, like Doug said, my name's Kirk Bailey. I uh, joined DuPont in 1999. Uh, in an operational role. So I've been working around the sulfur molecule since around 2002. Uh, maintenance roles, operational roles, managing turnarounds, consulting, and then went to commercial side back around 2009. And now uh, work with MECS since 2010, uh, located in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, support around 44 different sites across the US and Canada, uh, mainly in the refining industry, the metallurgical industry. Excellent. Awesome. So, uh, and, that, and I think oh, it'll be ahead, really Jean. important for people to know what kind of socks you're wearing today, because that is one of your traits. That and belts. You kind of have a specialty. <laughs> so well, I, I, did, I also did have on my FRC uh, coveralls for the first time since March today, and Jean yes. did not like the logo on that. So I had to take <laughs> FRC, and now I'm back into a, a polo shirt. So I was very excited to put on my Nomex for the first time since March, uh, but now I'm back in just a normal polo for the household. So thanks, Kirk, for the introduction. Uh, so first thing first, uh, let's start at the very beginning. So what happens when the acid gets sent out from the alkylation unit to be processed? Give me some ideas about what that looks like, how it operates. Give me a little bit of the, as we would say in the U.S., the kick of the tires. All right, so I'll give you a little bit of flavor what happens as you ship that spin acid from the alkyl unit. It's going to first go into a, a storage tank. Uh, from there, you're going to pipe that, pump that into a decomposition furnace. So carbon steel, brick lined vessel, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to burn that with some type of fuel source, whether that's fuel gas, H2S, molten sulfur, uh, natural gas. 
that decomposes the sulfuric acid, uh, the spent mm -hmm. sulfuric acid into SO2, mainly SO2, uh, and it's roughly around 1,055 degrees Celsius. Uh, from there, wow. it goes through a waste heat boiler. Uh, you're gonna recover some of that heat, generate some steam there, uh, which you can use in other parts of your process, both in the acid plant and the refinery as well. Uh, after that, you've got all these ash particles from the hydrocarbon that's sitting there in uh, the spent acid. So you wanna scrub out that ash. So we have what we call a dyno waste system, or it's called gas cleaning uh, overall. So we'll cool that gas stream down, we'll scrub that gas of all the particulates, um, and then we're gonna send that over to the contact side. So at the contact side, uh, we've got a gas stream uh, that's mainly SO2, oxygen, and nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And uh, no uh, hydrocarbon particles in there. We run that through uh, a drying tower. We take out any residual moisture. That typically operates around 93% sulfuric acid. Uh, we heat that gas through a converter. Uh, that SO2 is converted to SO3, which is also a uh, exothermic reaction, and we use that uh, exothermic reaction heat uh, to both heat gas streams as well as to preheat boiler feed water and generate additional steam. Uh, so that SO3 molecule is the one we really want. So we take that and we absorb that into circulating sulfuric acid, uh, bring that up to about, and as the SO3 is absorbed into acid, it uh, becomes stronger. Uh, we control the strength by adding water. Water is also an exothermic reaction. We add that to strong acid. So. Uh, once you do that, you've got strong acid, roughly 99.2% sulfuric, water white. Uh, ship that out uh, to storage tanks. And then whether you're doing that by pipeline, by bars, by rail, uh, you ship that back to the alkyl unit. And then uh, you've got water or you've got acid, fresh acid that's being charged to your alkyl system to start the process all over. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a loop. Uh, you use the acid and water white goes in the alkyl unit, comes out spin acid and then it gets uh, circulated back to the acid plant and it's in a circle. So you burn it, you clean it, you convert, convert it, convert and it. then you absorb it. Yep. That, that's correct. Over Boom. And over and over uh, again. Four steps. See, he talked for what, you know, five minutes? I got yeah. it in five seconds. Boom. <laughs> You're quick. <laughs> quick study. I got to keep it simple. <laughs> Kirk, I mean, give us an idea of what we're talking about, the criticality that a spin acid recovery unit has in the operation of an alkylation operation as well. Give us an idea uh, of that. So as you, as you previously discussed, uh, I use sulfuric acid as a catalyst in the alkylation reaction. Uh, right. It goes through that, that alkylation reaction, it picks up some impurities, so hydrocarbons, water. <laughs> so as you spin that uh, spin acid down, get down to your 90% high, 88% concentration, you need to take it out of the alkylation system and send that all to the site to be regenerated. Um, so once you do that, you've got roughly 90% sulfuric acid, 5% mm -hmm. hydrocarbons, 5% water, and then you need to get that back to roughly 99.2% virgin sulfuric acid, which is water white and clean, which you charge your alkylation system back in on the front end. So why okay. is 99.2 so critical? Um, I know a long time ago we used to uh, spec 98% and I know there are some uh, processes that actually provide even lower percentages to the alkyl unit. Is there, I mean 99.2 is very <clears throat> specific. So 92% is on the upper end uh, where you can make sulfuric acid. We'll have to worry about some environmental issues uh, from an opacity standpoint. So if you yep. William, so if you have a higher strength acid over 100%, uh, you have the ability to send out a big plume out of your stack. And, and no one wants that to go out of their stack. Do not want that. Do yeah. not want that. The neighbors don't like it at all. So it, when you do And also that, the closer you get to 100% acid, the closer you get to the danger zone with materials construction inside mm -hmm. that acid plant as well, as I understand it. That, that is correct. So 9.2% is the, the sweet spot uh, from instrumentations and control uh, in a sulfuric acid uh, facility. What it means to alkylation unit is you get to start at a higher acid concentration and spin that down to your lower rate. Whether you're spending down to 90% or 88%, uh, you have a bigger window to spin that acid down. And what that gives you is actually an increase in octane levels by about a half a point to, to a point. Well, I, I would assume since, since you're making alkylate product and you're using acid on site, there's probably a variety of different ways to get rid of that, uh, that acid. I, I think uh, there were some comments in some of our previous sessions that talked about whether you do it on site, off site, or go into some of that a little bit, Kurt, and tell us uh, what some of the options are there for uh, some of our alkylation clients. 
Yeah, so some of your alkylation uh, spent has is going to be processed on site. Uh, that could either be done by the refinery owner operator. Uh, that could be uh, the sulfuric gas regeneration plant could also be operated by a third party on your inside your fence line. Or you could take that material and ship it out via truck, by rail, uh, by barges, and have that sent out to a, a third party toller. Uh, mm -hmm. And what that means is you've got uh, companies that specialize in regenerating spent sulfuric acid and turning that back into fr uh, virgin acid. So okay. it really depends on your location. So is there infrastructure around you? Are you very uh, geographically remote? Do you have uh, access to rail? Do you have access to rivers that have barge access? Uh, do you have trucks, a trucking company that will move your acid around? Mm -hmm. what or are a pipeline, I would assume too. Or, or yeah. a pipeline. So refineries that have an acid plant on site, uh, mm -hmm. very typical to have a pipeline from the alkyl unit to a storage tank at the acid plant and then have a pipeline with fresh acid going plant back to the alkyl unit. So. Mm -hmm really depends on location, um, geography. So if your nearest spin acid regeneration unit is a thousand uh, miles away, it probably makes more sense to have one on site than it does to ship it all the way across with those environmental and safety uh, concerns that you'd have there. What are some of the benefits of having your spin acid recovery on site? I mean, since some of our clients choose to do that, is there a definitive advantage other than what we just mentioned? And there's an absolutely a reason to have a regeneration site on your plant uh, proper. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have the ability to burn H2S gas within the uh, decomposition ah, right, place right. along with this, the spin acid. So it gives you an outlet for additional H2S gas. Uh, you can run a different crude plate that's a little higher uh, in sulfur content and still have somewhere to process that out versus your SRUs. Uh, if one of your SRUs go down, you actually have the ability to take that uh, H2S gas, put that to your acid plant for a period of time and make mm -hmm sulfuric acid with that H2S. Uh, also, it's going to be the lowest cost uh, for you to make your own acid or regenerate your own acid versus sending that to a third party. Uh, and then you don't have the transportation involved. Uh, again, you're not uh, having a, a profit put on uh, by a third party to process that for you for that service. Right. So it's the lowest cost the way to regenerate your own acid. Uh, that being said, uh, the Regen unit is very different than other operating units uh, within a refinery. It operates at very low pressure. Uh, one of the things that I see in other refinery units is water washing vessels to get them clean. And that is something you absolutely do not want to do in a, in a regen plant. It will melt your plant down. <laughs> Bad things will happen. Nice. So very different uh, mindset when you're getting ready to uh, inspect, maintain the sulfuric acid unit than other units within the refinery. Right. Obviously, um, you mentioned it's the uh, lower cost option, you know, and I'm assuming you mean by cap by OPEX. CapEx, obviously, that's a whole nother ball of wax, which is why people would at some point prefer to, to toll or, or what have you. But is there a cutoff in plant size at which point you're like, okay, the, um, the CapEx is going to pay out because the OPEX is going to be so low. Is there a size that dictates that or how does that determination made? Well, in the, uh, in, it depends, which is the, the cop out answer, but it, it does depend both on uh, what kind of regional infrastructure you have. Mm -hmm. If you're at a remote geographic location uh, and you want to have alkylate there, uh, you need to have an SAR. Yeah, yeah. So th there's plants in some world regions that have as small as a 30 ton per day spin acid regeneration. Wow. Okay. Uh, so, but, but the larger plant size you have, uh, you have economies of scale. So your cost, your capex per uh, dollar of acid produced uh, is lower. So right. the larger you can get, uh, the better because of that economy of scale. At the same time, you don't want to have excess capacity if you have no outlet for your acid and you don't want to produce more than your alkylate uh, plant or your alkyl plant you need uh, unless you have uh, some refiners actually sell some of their fresh acid to the outside market. Uh, yeah. So they do yep. take some of the H2S gas and uh, make extra acid and sell that out to other clients they have out there as a revenue stream. Right. Yeah, that sounds like a good deal for those that that can do that if they have a, a built up uh, industrial infrastructure around them that can use the right. acid because acids like the sulfuric acid specifically is the, is the uh, greatest produced commodity chemical in the world. So if you not only the greatest complexes, produced, but the greatest used. I yes, mean, absolutely. absolutely. It, it, a lot of people don't realize that. And it's very important for a lot of industries. Uh, but you know, you mentioned something about size. Uh, and so I want to circle back to that for a second. 
Um, I know that uh, refineries come in a variety of different outputs and some uh, locations have small alpha units, some, some have very large based on the type of feed stocks that they have. We got into that discussion several, a uh, couple months ago. So what kind of sizing does that kind of go along with with the acid plant? I mean, it sounds like these acid plants can, can go down to very small, like 30 to 75 tons a day. I mean, what's the, what's the range that you typically see in association with these alkylation units? So for an alkylation unit for an on-site refinery, uh, you're mm -hmm. anywhere between 30 tons a day and probably the biggest is 1,000. But I'd say nominally, you're going to be somewhere between 400 and 600 tons a day uh, for region units that are associated with a single alkylation unit. So the alkylation unit can have multiple different contactors uh, mm -hmm. there. But that same refinery site would have a region unit somewhere between 400 and 600 tons per day of processing capabilities. Gotcha. And so the, those uh, spin acid recovery plants also have to have the ability to occasionally burn some sulfur because of makeup of uh, sulfur uh, in case the crude doesn't have as much as their analyte always carries, or is that a concern? So you do have to have some of the ability of sulfur makeup. Uh, mm -hmm. One that comes from molten sulfur or H2S, or you could actually bring in a truckload of acid from a, another source uh, once a month to, to butt up. There sure. are losses within uh, the sulfuric acid when it's being regenerated. That sulfur is going out uh, some in influence uh, throughout the process. Yeah, but at the same time, your, your makeup is not that great. You can make it up, like I said, between molten sulfur being fed into the furnace or hydrogen sulfide being fed into the furnace. Both right. sulfur and H2S provide a fuel source. So you're back to gas because to decompose the spent acid, uh, you have to apply energy. It's an endothermic reaction. Mm -hmm. And you need some type of fuel source to do that. So if you already have sulfur on site or H2S on site, it's going to be a really good deal for you just to pump that into the furnace and recover that sulfur. Yep, absolutely. What about, the refineries? And, what about the refineries that have the uh, um, you know mounds of sulfur where it's not molten, it's like uh, solid. It's grilled, yeah. grilled sulfur. Is that yeah. grilled? Okay, I didn't that realize that was sulfur. the word for it. Okay, so is that usable as a feedstock to a sulfuric acid region plant? Absolutely. It's uh, So grilled sulfur, it's, uh, it's comes from a source where they don't have an outlet to take that molten sulfur, whether it's close enough, and so they pelletize that into small pellets and then around the world uh, Vancouver has a monstrous uh, amount of prilled sulfur sitting out right by their harbor uh, that goes around the world uh, so uh, what you do once you have prilled sulfur is you have to melt that back down um, okay. mostly mainly steam uh, and that goes into a feed pit and you pump that once in molten form back into the furnace at that point Got it. Okay. that makes it nice and convenient yeah. good deal so um, besides the fact that the acid plant, you know, turns that uh, spent acid back into acid that's available for use to make more alkylation product, it is exothermic and it does give off a lot of heat in all areas of the process. I mean, if you're not familiar with sulfuric acid, ask MECS, we can, we can definitely explain that to you. But uh, every step of the way in making sulfuric acid is exothermic. And in that process, a lot of steam is typically generated. Does the refinery use a lot of that steam in various processes for heating? And does that make it even more economical in, in some cases? Or is that heat that's used for other purposes in the plant? I mean, give me an idea there. I mean, because there could yes. be some, some folks out there that don't realize the utility that that acid plant could provide. Yeah, so steam generation is uh, very integral to a sulfuric acid plant. So the... Uh, front end of a decomposition, you're actually adding heat. So that part is right. to break that down. But once you have that gas stream leaking the decomposition furnace, roughly 1,055 degrees Celsius, you can recover that heat down, um, a high pressure steam at that point. Also, as you go through the process and the SO2 is converted to SO3, that's also a very exothermic reaction. Mm -hmm. That heat is used to um, preheat the gas to get to the correct temperature for the catalyst, but some of that is also used to preheat the boiler feed water that is going to um, the waste heat boiler where you're generating that high pressure steam. High pressure being 400 to 700 PSIG. So uh, it, it's relative in the refinery worlds uh, what high pressure steam is. Uh, so yep. if you have auxiliary boilers on your site, uh, that's a point source for emissions. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes you can take the steam from the sulfuric acid plant and shut down one of your auxiliary boilers. Wow. And reduce your overall emission from the point. Reduce your overall emissions, uh, particularly 
So it, it's a good thing. Um, MECS design sulfuric acid plants are designed to run over 95% reliably over the course of a two year campaign. So uh, very reliable, they're on stream all the time, uh, continuous operation. So uh, a very good deal for again, shutting down boilers, uh, providing additional steam to the site. Okay, cool. excellent. Also extremely important in keeping that alpha unit running because alpha, as we all know is very, very valuable in the marketplace. And oh, absolutely. Uh, you, wanna, you wanna keep that alpha unit running. Yeah, so again, that goes back reliability factor. You don't want to shut down your alkyl unit because you have no outlet for your sulfuric acid, spent sulfuric acid, or you don't have sulfuric acid coming in. So yeah. again, you have to have the, the fresh acid in some place for the spent acid to go. So you need your acid plant to run reliably when you're operating. You mentioned uh, that, uh, you know, the, the utilization of some of the power off of the spent acid recovery units is a key thing. Is there anything else uh, that the spent acid recovery may be of benefit to an alkylation unit or the refinery as a whole that maybe goes overlooked? Uh, that uh, is something that is t something to truly consider if, uh, if a plant is considering installing an SAR. So a specific reason, um, there's been some refineries that I've worked with uh, in the past that had aging SRU units. Mm -hmm. And they, had, they made the decision that they were going to shut down their SRUs and not invest that capital in there and invest in a sulfuric acid regeneration plant. So instead of spending significant dollars on the SRU units, uh, they invested in a sulfuric acid plant, which handled both their H2S loading as well as the uh, sulfuric acid coming from the ALK unit. So they had Absolutely. a fair uh, cost savings, uh, more operational efficiency for them. Uh, so it worked really well. Again, and by we, SRU units, you're meaning like Klaus units or something Klaus similar? Klaus units, self recovery units, correct. Okay. Um, you and I have done a lot of traveling over the years, and we used to uh, go to uh, Alki uh, facilities where they have an on-site acid region plant, and we would often run into uh, acid plants that were uh, really having a hard time um, operating successfully and reliably. Um, would you say, what are the reasons for that? Would you say that's largely um, uh, maintenance or lack thereof? Uh, is it a lack of focus because the refinery thinks of it more as a utility? Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts there? Or it, was it simply um, aging facilities, as you mentioned, and this particular aging facility instead of the SRU was the acid plant and they just didn't give it the attention it needed? So an SAR in any aspect, whoever's operating it, you have ongoing maintenance. So uh, every every shipment of acid, every pipe of acid has some part of the plant that's getting shipped out there because the acid is corrosive. So you do have to do uh, proper maintenance, uh, which involves uh, maintenance turnaround planning on a set frequency, uh, preventative maintenance, predictive maintenance is ideal. Uh, a lot of plants as they age over time, go to the reactive maintenance phase where they haven't been taken care of, they haven't been invested in. Um, at a refinery location specifically, I see a lot of uh, personnel uh, turnover as far as uh, the technical and engineers. Uh, they're spending three months, six months, maybe a year, 18 months at the max, wow, where they're going short. to a different unit, which is very, very short. short. So that technical institutional knowledge uh, from an engineering standpoint is not always there. Uh, you do have a lot of longtime operators that will stay with a uh, acid unit, a regen unit over time. And that's where a lot of that knowledge base resides. Uh, but then there's also uh, different refineries where the uh, acid plant operator may want to be the alkyl plant operator, or the FCC operator, because those are more higher profile uh, units within the yeah. refinery. Yeah. So there's also personnel turnover in the operational ranks. So if you have a lot of turnover, both in your operational ranks, as well as your technical forces, then um, you're going to have problems over the long term because of maintaining and operating that facility. So there, there are ways around that as far as uh, working with technical providers. MECS is very proficient at troubleshooting, uh, assisting operations with maintaining a plant uh, and operating that plant, troubleshooting that plant efficiently, uh, because that's what MECS does. So right. uh, in a refinery, you've only got uh, one acid plant. Uh, you've got a lot of different hydrocarbon units. Mm -hmm. So right. that one acid plant operates very differently than the rest of your uh, refining units. So it's treated a little bit differently. So you don't have the same level of expertise on site. Right. So it really sounds like the expert opinion that you would give uh, to a plant manager at a petrochemical facility is you have to look at the sulfuric acid recovery unit uh, as a completely 
different mindset as the rest of the plant because the rest of the plant, the equipment's 30 to 50, sometimes older years old and has very little maintenance because there's very little corrosion rate. There's not a whole lot that corrodes much of that low grade stainless or car in some cases carbon steel that's throughout mm -hmm. that plant because it's immersed it with with oil but in the case of the sulfuric acid unit you've got to take a little bit sharper look at things and and figure out what's going on and do maintenance as necessary and it, those two different regimes are very very different uh, when you mm -hmm. have the same personnel taking care of both of those types of equipment so uh, to me that just sounds like totally different regimes so I could certainly understand why some plants would want a third party to operate that plant in some cases because it is so radically yeah. different. Yeah, another example of that dog is uh, within the uh, region unit we have a, series of di uh, a dying wave system which is a series of FRP vessels so if I yes plastic and in those vessels those are not allowed in the rest of the refining unit because they'll burn they'll melt so right. but they're very suitable for the weak sulfuric acid concentration so unless Absolutely. several vessels that it has to always see now which is, would be very costly versus uh, FRP uh, but you have to that's a different mindset and say hey we are allowed uh, FRP in our site or we don't allow it so right. just another example there yeah yep. Absolutely. From a design perspective, certainly the specs in a refinery are quite different than in a chemical industry uh, in general. Honestly, whatever you decide to do will be fine. You say that now, Jeannie. Until <laughs> and they'll be like, and then I'll just stand go, up and go oh, boom! No. But anyway, no. Oh, okay. Maybe oh yeah, point. there you go. <laughs> Put it in front of your face, Kirk. Otherwise, it, it goes away. There you go. See now you can see. It. <laughs> He's a pro. He's a yeah. pro. Yeah. Pro. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. All right, cool. Thanks, everyone. All right, bye. Later, All right, bye. bye. All right, silliness aside, we're back. It's good to be back with everyone. I hope <laughs> Hi, you found everybody. that discussion interesting. <laughs> you know, we talked about recycle, recovery, and utilization of waste products from one process to make things more efficient, which, like I said earlier, is, is a great thing to do, and that's definitely what SARs can do in a petrochemical facility with alkylation. You know, and it's great to know that uh, an ACR can be an integral part of the operation of alkylation units in various ways, and I'm glad we touched on all that. So it's good to have you with us again, uh, Kirk. Welcome back to the winner's circle, Kirk. It's great to be here. Thanks again for uh, <laughs> that amount of silliness and putting my name <laughs> He-Man uh, yeah. on the internet again. So um, it was one of my original action figures from uh, my youth. So I, I called it his G.I. Joe and he, he, you know, he gave me that look like, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah exactly. Shows you, uh, yeah, how old I guess I am. <laughs> yep. <laughs> anyway, oh, and my no, lack, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I didn't and say and yep my lack of, of knowledge on action figures. Anyway, so we do have some great questions already queued up. Uh, yeah. So again, uh, attendees, please don't be shy in asking questions, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Kirk, you're in the hot seat. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, so the first question uh, is how, how do we go about analyze, okay, how to go about the analysis to determine if an SAR facility can pay out? So again, as we briefly discussed in, in the presentation or the uh, during the uh, video, it really depends on where you're located. Uh, do you have the infrastructure around uh, your facility to have uh, a pipeline? Do you have trucks? Do you have barges? Do you have access to rail facility? Uh, if you're in a remote location, uh, you may not have any anything around anything around you uh, where you can do that. So you would need if you want to make alkalate at your uh, refinery, you would actually need to have an on-site SAR. Uh, that being said, the larger you get a plant, uh, the more economic it gets uh, because the amount of capex you put in is reduced uh, for the ton of acid that you're producing. Uh, so in the U.S., uh, we have regional locations where they take in uh, alkali or spent acid from numerous refineries, uh, process that in a singular facility. That's what we call a 500, 600 tons a day uh, process capabilities. But in some other world regions where you may not have, uh, like I said, the rail or the access to transportation, you may have a facility that's as small as 30 tons a day. 
because that alkylate product is so important that world region. Uh, as you go and look at, uh, do you want to produce alkylate? How valuable is that to your refinery is one question. Uh, the cost of how remote you are is another question. And then you have to go through those evaluations about if I really want to have uh, produce alkylate, then I, I need to find something to do with my spin acid. Okay, excellent. Um, and next... imagine that that analysis can be pretty uh, involved and take a, a good bit of time to do because you got to come up with a value for each one of those propositions as well, besides just the obvious monetary value uh, to, to, to some of those as well. Yeah, absolutely. So when you're going through an evaluation of whether it makes sense, so there's people that are saying, I'm going to increase my output capacity at my current refinery. Uh, does right. it make sense instead of sending this out? Uh, so I'm going to double my output uh, capacity. So do I need to put a new, can I put an SAR facility in here? And the, typically the process you would go through that is uh, you start looking at what is a high level plus or minus 40% order of magnitude estimate for that. Right. Uh, at that point, does that make sense? Does it make, does it create a hurdle rate at that point? Then you go into, hey, I need to hire a, an engineering firm that can get me a, a tighter estimate. So this is, a, you know, plus or minus 20, 25%. And then you say, well, that meets my hurdle or it's kind of closer. And then you have to refine that even more, go through some uh, basic engineering, go through detail engineering and get that to, you know, plus or minus five, 10% uh, estimate. And then you can say, hey, we've got really hard numbers here. We've got a, a firm that's going to build this plant for us, or we're going to manage the firm that will build this plant for us. And it really, you have to play all those factors in there. Uh, how quickly is your payback time? How large a facility? How much alkylate do you want to produce? What kind of pricing you're getting for your uh, alkylate? Uh, transportation costs, uh, all those things play into it. It's a very complex equation as you're looking to evaluate. Uh, does it make sense to put an on-site SAR at an existing refinery or to install an on-site SAR at a, a new refinery? Okay, so uh, somewhat related, um, what are the CapEx and OpEx for an on-site acid region plant? I think I already know the answer. <laughs> it depends. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it always depends. So, I mean, if you're asking it, what are the CapEx, I mean, your CapEx is your expenditure to put the plant on site and then your ongoing maintenance. Uh, your OPEX, I mean, you've got your fuel costs, uh, you've got uh, effluent costs. Uh, what are you doing with your wastewater? Uh, what are you doing from a, a scrubbing standpoint to get your SO2 emissions that you need to get out? Uh, your NOx emissions that are also playing a factor here. All right. Um, so next question in the queue is, what are the environmental impact considerations? So again, so very important uh, from a permitting standpoint, uh, we're looking at SO2 uh, leaving the stack. Uh, you're looking at NOx uh, particles leaving the stack. Uh, you're looking at acid mist. Uh, you're looking at PM 2.5, PM 10 are typically some of the ones that we see in air permits here, at least in the United States. Uh, so to get to current levels and depending on the size and depending on your air permit requirements, you could have a concentration based uh, permit uh, limit or you could have a total tons of year of each of the different effluents that are coming out of there. Uh, you also have uh, uh, aqueous effluents that are coming from the gas cleaning section that have to be dealt with somewhere. Uh, that's a weak sulfuric acid and we'll call it four to 10% uh, sulfuric. Uh, you have some uh, ash particles that need to be dealt with. Typically, that's also in the effluent that you deal with in some type of wastewater system. So it really depends on how big your plant is, what your air permit looks like, but the major ones from a permitting standpoint are going to be SO2, NOx, acid mist, and particulate matter. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so uh, a great question from one of our attendees also. Can an SRU unit handle sour water strippers H2S? So an SAR unit can handle uh, the sour water stripper gas. Uh, typically when you have sour water stripper gas, you have higher levels of ammonia that are coming with that. Uh, so we burn that, you're gonna create more uh, NOx particles. Nox. So, right. and so when you get NOx, uh, you have to deal with that. Uh, so as it, uh, you burn sour water stripper gas, it's harder to burn than just uh, clean H2S gas, uh, gas stream that's going through there. So those NOx particles will do a couple of things. So you form NOx in the furnace. Uh, typically that a lot of that is uh, thermal NOx. So you form that in the furnace mainly. As it goes through the gas cleaning system, it doesn't get scrubbed out. Uh, you keep going to the contact process. Some of that uh, NOx will form nitrocyl sulfuric acid and it will dissolve yep. in the uh, sulfuric acid. That'll typically get, some of that will get captured uh, in your mist eliminators, which are in your, your process vessel. So your, your inner pass absorbing tower, your final absorbing tower. And you have the ability to segregate that uh, into various locations and either reburn that 
And if you reburn it, you actually end up in a thermal equilibrium uh, back in the furnace for the amount of NOx you're forming. So you're not actually concentrating that NOx. Um, but to get to the current level, low level of NOx that's required in a lot of places, you need to have some type of NOx mitigation system. So on the front end is what you do, you try to minimize the amount of NOx that you produce uh, on the front end in the decomposition furnace. So you actually have a two-stage furnace. Uh, the first stage is gonna be a reducing zone uh, where you're, you're oxygen deficient. And then you have a second stage where you actually add in the rest of the oxygen that's needed for combustion of all the particles in there. And what that does, it reduces the flame temperature, reduces the amount of thermal NOx that you make in that decomposition furnace. So you don't have to deal with it later, uh, later in the process. Uh, that may not get you where you need to go. Uh, so there are some ways that you can do a, an SCR, uh, which convert that NOx back to nitrogen, or you have an ability to uh, inject ozone uh, toward the tail gas, or toward the tail of the process uh, into the tail gas scrubber. And as you do that, that'll also convert the NOx back into nitrogen and allow you to meet your environmental permit. So there's a couple routes. So first of all, you wanna minimize the amount of NOx that you're forming. And then uh, secondly, you're like, hey, what do I do with the rest of this NOx? And there's, again, some equipment designs that can take out some of that uh, nitrosyl sulfuric acid or nitre. Um, and then you have to potentially deal with the additional NOx there. And again, the reason we're talking about NOx is because of sour water stripper gas. So you can burn it. It just has some additional uh, requirements or additional considerations during the design phase. Yeah, if you're getting just straight H2S from somewhere and there's no ammonia, then it's a different set of situation. You don't have to worry as much about making NOx, although you can still get it because you have nitrogen in the uh, the air coming in as well, uh, as I understand it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So when you're burning hydrogen sulfide, I mean, it's going to have a high flame temperature, uh, but you can right. mitigate that. So again, you'll you'll form some amount of thermal NOx, but you will have that additional ammonia that's coming in with the sour water stripper gas. It's right. not as much that's coming through there. So again, the same techniques from a two-stage furnace, a redox furnace, will help you minimize the amount of NOx that you're forming on the front end, and some equipment designs on the back end, either um, from SCR or an ENOX system where we're injecting ozone into that. All right, great. Um, so next question in the queue is, is it worth increasing the fresh acid strength target from 99.2% to 99.5%? Uh, so I'll tell you, it depends. Um, so 99.2% in a sulfuric acid plant when we're producing sulfuric acid, um, once you get over 100% sulfuric acid, it forms what it's called oleum, and it will smoke and produce this big white cloud, uh, which is really bad. Your neighbors don't want to see that. Uh, you don't want to put that out of your plant stack. So the way that you control that at 99.2% where you're taking your product feed off of that is ideally the sweet spot. Uh, if you go over that 99.2, you get closer to your 99.5, you're getting really close to that oleum range. Uh, so your strength control, water addition have to be very dialed in. So instrumentation is very important. Uh, monitoring and your lab analysis is also very important there. Uh, so you could see some advantages if you went to 99.5. Uh, if you could get someone to provide you 99.5% acid. But some of the instrumentation, once you get, there's an inflection point depending on what type of instrumentation you're using. Um, and your sulfuric acid may look like it's actually getting weaker when it's still in the oleum range and gets stronger and stronger. So there's some uh, interlocks have to be uh, really dialed in and set appropriately. Your instrumentation has to be working really well. So that's why the producers on the upper end of the scale, the MECS design plant, the producers have more confidence in uh, consistently producing 99.2% sulfuric versus a 99.5. But again, the purpose of having that 99.2% uh, acid is you can spin that lower down uh, through your alkylation unit. So you're going to produce higher octane fuels. Uh, you'll have less corrosion in your equipment. There, there's a host of advantages to having a, a longer spin rate uh, in your alkylation unit. All right. So next question, uh, what is the approximate high pressure steam production per ton of spent acid processed? So uh, approximately uh, in a dry gas plant, you're going to produce uh, around a ton of steam per ton of acid uh, during the course of the production. That so was that can be looked at as a means of finding out how much heating value you have elsewhere in your, your petrochemical facility, for instance. Uh, that is correct. So, I mean, if you have a 500 ton a day acid plant, you're producing uh, 500 tons of steam. So, you know, you would say my header pressure is at 550. I'm producing 600 from the acid plant, shipping that over, uh, augmenting what you have uh, in the refinery proper. As sure. we talked about in the, the podcast, I mean, we have the ability to shut down, potentially to shut down auxiliary boilers, which are another point source. Uh, and the less point sources you have, 
more environmental people like that on site. Uh, so that's, that's a good thing as well. And technically it's a, it's a non uh, hydrocarbon. So it's a, a greener energy when it's, it's a, technically it's a yellow energy since you're burning sulfur or sulfuric acid. Uh, I like that. <laughs> <clears throat> Oh, the silliness continues. Okay, so uh, next question. Uh, alkyl unit acid has components other than acid. How do the entrained hydrocarbons or SAOs and water content impact the SAR unit? So you'll have in a, we'll call it a, a typical alkylation spin acid. You have 90% uh, sulfuric acid, 5% hydrocarbon, and 5% water nominally. So the hydrocarbons, as you spray that spent sulfuric acid solution into your decomposition furnace, we have to uh, atomize that very well, small droplets. Uh, as those droplets are uh, in the presence of heat, so either fuel gas burners, H2S gas, mold sulfur, to get that required heat input, uh, decomposes that H2SO4 molecule uh, into SO2, SO3 uh, molecules. Uh, also, the hydrocarbons that are in there are also gonna react with the oxygen that's in there and burn. And then the water essentially will be a water vapor as you're going through that uh, moisture. The same thing with the hydrocarbons that are burning, they're producing water as well. So uh, when you have those acid soluble oils, uh, those are also getting burned when they're atomized and burning. So essentially you've got SO2, a small amount of SO3 that you're trying to minimize uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and some water vapor that's going through there. Uh, you'll take out that SO3 in the gas cleaning system. And essentially as you go through the process, you have a uh, high concentration, or we'll call it roughly 10% for alkyl SAR, uh, SO2 concentration that's going to the first pass of the converter. Uh, you've got uh, balance oxygen, nitrogen. You need that oxygen as well to convert the SO2 to SO3 in your converter downstream. Alrighty. So um, a question about acid contaminants. Are there acid contaminants that alkyl operators should be concerned about, um, and what causes those contaminants to come from an SAR unit? So typically in a alkyl SAR, you're not gonna see a lot of concerning contaminants in your acid. Uh, you're gonna have some iron that's coming in there uh, that'll get uh, flushed out in the gas cleaning system. In a sulfuric acid plant, uh, I get worried about fluorides, chlorides, mercuries. Um, amines also. Amines as well. But I typically you, don't see those in alkyl uh, spin acid. So I think the question might be going the other direction. Um, should alkyl operators be concerned about any contaminants coming in with the fresh acid? Ah, that is that a different from the there. SAR. That is. That's the way I interpreted it, but I suppose it could it could go either way. Um, I was thinking about it from the acid perspective versus the alkyl perspective. So thanks for clarifying that. Yes, yes. I'm I'm here for you, Kirk. Yes. So I mean, there is um, in the when you're thinking about uh, fresh acid that's coming back to you, that's 99.2%. Uh, acid. Uh, you want to make sure there's no uh, particulates in there. You should have an iron concentration. Uh, there are some people that monitor uh, NIDA or NSA that's in there. Uh, there is a debate within the industry in general about how NIDA affects corrosion equipment. Uh, you've got some people that says it accelerates corrosion. You have some people that says in certain ranges it actually acts as a, a passivation film and actually lowers the corrosion rate. So I, there's not uh, a data that says nitre content or concentration has a, uh, there's anecdotal notes that says sometimes it has accelerated corrosion. There's sometimes anecdotal notes that said, no, we have lower corrosion and we don't even monitor it. Um, so, but I say water white, your acid concentration is, uh, you're not going to have other types of impurities as you burn through that because again, it's, it's a circular uh, loop where whatever contaminants you're getting back from the alkyl unit to the acid plant majority of those it should be iron and hydrocarbons are getting scrubbed out in gas cleaning and then you're coming back and you're not introducing anything uh, back into the process uh, except for uh, water particularly if you're using uh, RO water uh, as dilution water in the process you're not adding anything in there as well as far as any contaminants salts or anything like that yeah all righty um, so next question, does the SAR unit have corrosion concerns? In the alkyl, we use stainless steel and carbon steel for our acid lines. Is that the same for the SAR unit? So SAR is a very corrosive environment. So it is a, uh, it's eating itself up every day throughout the course of the day, throughout the course of production campaign. So there's part of those, uh, that piping that's going out with the, uh, the product acid as well. Uh, so in a, SAR plant, we have very specific materials of construction, depending on what, uh, where that equipment is, what concentration the acid is, 
and what the temperature of the acid is. So uh, MECS uses a lot of high silica stainless steel uh, called Z-Core, standing for zero corrosion. Uh, very acid resistant to hot concentrated sulfuric acid. So essentially uh, very low corrosion rates throughout the course of uh, 20 plus 30 years over a piece of equipment. Uh, there's also some equipment that we use that has anodically protected where we put a, a charge on that an acid cooler uh, creates a passivation film that's on there. Uh, historically, there are some plants out there that use uh, ductile iron. Uh, that's a causes some, it creates a passivation layer, a sulfate layer in that piping system. Uh, there's other pieces of equipment that have different materials of construction, like we talked about the FRP. So that's for mainly the weak sulfuric acid. That's the five to ten percent sulfuric. Uh, but in the strong acid section, where we have, which is probably closer to what uh, the alkyl units are operating at. Uh, we either use mainly high silica stainless steel called z uh, for our piping system and other equipment. Uh, but that's also very, the temperature in the acid plants can be much hotter than it is in the alkyl unit. So even if you ship the product acid, it goes through a cooler uh, from the acid plant, and then it goes to a storage tank uh, before it's used in the alkyl unit. And since it's in the storage tank, you're essentially going to ambient uh, conditions at that point. So your carbon steels and your stainless steels are uh, more suitable materials of construction at that point uh, for that acid concentration in that temperature in those in those ranges. So I guess this is a question that's not in the queue, but I'm curious. Um, could you use Z-Core piping um, or metal metallurgy in the alkyl unit? I guess, uh, you know, if, with the temperatures we're talking about, it's probably okay uh, to not use it, but then if there was an excursion or, or something happened, uh, that could potentially really prevent uh, issues so, so you could uh, use it. Uh, it's going to be more expensive than a, a typical sure. stainless steel or carbon steel. So there'd have to be a real reason why you would right. use it in that application. So is it hot? Uh, is it getting baked by the sun? Is it staying stagnant <laughs> in, in a line? Yeah. Um, so it would drive me to look, investigate that. Okay. But for the most part, um, I wouldn't recommend upgrading the metallurgy um, unless you're seeing you know, accelerated corrosion. And I, then it. I wanted to understand why. Uh, also, there's uh, for some applications, if you get low on the concentration range, uh, it's actually more corrosive for certain materials of construction. So okay. very specific about uh, selection of materials of construction, depending on concentration and temperature. Process Got conditions. It. Yep. Process yep. conditions. Correct. Got it. Okay. So um, one of our last questions, uh, can an SAR unit concentrate a diluted acid, say 95% available in the market? And then follow on is directly on absorbing towers, not through the furnace. So it sounds like this person is asking, could you buy 95% acid um, or make up open acid. market and then send it directly to the absorbing towers and concentrate it? Uh, mm. Potentially, yes. I mean, that's going to be more dilute than your inner pass absorbing towers can be operating at. So essentially you're adding uh, some amount of water. So you'd probably back out your dilution water there. Yep. I have not seen anyone do that in practice. Um, there are some plants that will, um, if they're trying to keep their plant operating, uh, they'll take fresh acid and actually burn it in the decomposition furnace. And uh, that's yep. simply just to keep the plant going from a, through a thermal cycle. So they'll take fresh acid, 95%, 98% burn it in the decomposition furnace. So it's inefficient. Uh, but again, it prevents that plant from going through a thermal cycle. Uh, thinking back, I have not, again, not seen anyone take a lower acid, 95%, uh, 93% sulfuric. The 93 is very available on the marketplace uh, yeah. and put that directly into a uh, absorbing tower because uh, that strong acid system, you have two or three strong acid towers and there's a mix of piping that actually uh, maintains the strength. So you've got cross flows going between 93% and 99% um, towers. And then you have water being added at various locations to control that strength because your absorbing towers are getting stronger. Uh, your drying towers are getting weaker. And you have to control the, that strength in a very uh, small range, uh, both from a corrosion standpoint and from a product quality standpoint. Yep. And I would be concerned about what's in that 5% besides water also. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there's fluorides or amines or something else that's going to cause corrosion issues in your acid plant, certainly you don't want to be adding that in there. But if it's clean and it's just water and sulfuric acid, potentially you could use it in your drying tower and then cross flow it like you're talking about, uh, Kurt, and, uh, and then bring it up in strength over time. 
So, I mean, this is, in my mind, speaks to, uh, there's uh, large metallurgical plants that are out there uh, around the world. They produce acid as a byproduct uh, from their gas cleaning. So it's an environmental control for them. The sulfuric acid is a byproduct. So for some of these metallurgical plants, so uh, copper, nickel, lead, uh, they have impurities in the ores that they're processing. So some of those impurities will actually end up in the acid. So if you're taking from a, a third party, particularly if it's from a metallurgical plant or a broker, uh, you really should have more uh, interest in those impurities that are getting into the plant because those things will have uh, more of an impact. So we had a question from a refiner, uh, it was probably a month ago, and they had mercury in their, in their acid and had no idea where that came from. And our thought process more revolved around you know, your makeup acid coming in from a metallurgical plant that did not have their uh, mercury uh, s abatement system working very well. They had mercury in their fresh acid that put into their alkyl process and that got circulated around again. Oh, you guys, wow. I mean, there's really not, um, there shouldn't be any mercury uh, by the time you get to the alkyl plant <laughs> and there shouldn't be any mercury not. that's coming in in a spin acid uh, regeneration plant either. Nope. Okay. Well, those were some excellent questions and um, some really awesome out of the box thinking. Um, so uh, that really wraps up our questions uh, for today. Oh, oh excellent. So, so Kirk, thank you for joining us. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. It was great. It's uh, always great to be in the presence of uh, Jeannie and Doug and have the opportunity <laughs> uh, to, to speak with uh, our refinery customers as well as our, uh, our acid customers out there. Yeah, and everyone yeah. be on the lookout for Kirk Bailey in our MECS uh, webinar series. You can learn more about that at mecsbestpractices.com. Um, very specific to the uh, acid process uh, in general, not necessarily yeah. acid regeneration, but sulfuric acid um, production in general for, for lots of different industries. Absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, if you're excited about learning about the sulfuric acid process, we, we do deep dives about the best practices in there. Uh, walk from the uh, front of the plant to the back of the plant. Uh, we do mm -hmm. deep dives on specific uh, aspects of the plant. Doug did a great one on mistillimators to start us off in May of this year. So yep. it's been an exciting project. And uh, like I said, if you're ex interested in that, uh, check us out. Yep. Cool. We also want to extend a thank you to all of the, the folks that have joined us today. Excellent yeah. questions, as well as uh, it's good to have you participating with us, even though you're in silence watching us and watching <laughs> us be silly as well. But we at CleanTech want all of you as our customers to know that we have an unwavering commitment to you, and we want to be able to provide the best in goods and services to you and your plants to keep them operating at tip-top condition. And we also want to hear from you as well. Uh, we have the ability for you to fill out a survey on what we're doing in these podcasts and give us feedback. If there's topics you'd like to hear uh, us talk about, or even if you think of questions later, we'd love to hear what those questions are about the topics we've had in the past as well. Yep. Uh, we just want to know how you're doing and how we're doing in that process of providing information to you about what it is we offer at Clean Tech. Yep, and next month, Doug, remind me, I think we're just gonna be chilling out next month, is that We right? are gonna be chilling out. Our buddy, uh, Randy <laughs> Peterson, and I think possibly another guest are gonna be with us as well to talk That's about right. optimization of refrigeration for these alkylation units. You know, they run at fairly cool temperatures compared to a lot of industrial processes and refrigeration is an important part of that operation. And we're gonna talk That's about right. making sure that's working right. Yep. And so Randy Peterson and Daniele Noto will be joining us uh, next month for that podcast. So be on the lookout. If you haven't registered for that podcast, please do so as soon as possible at refiningpitstop.com. Yep. So until next month, keep it running down the track. And we hope to see you again when you come in for another pit stop. <laughs>